back with another episode of In the Bag with Unc and Adam. Uncle Neely is, of course, Unc, and I got to know, first off, have you dried off since Saturday? I have. I'm, I'm there now. It, it took a couple days, but I'm there now. A lot of people were asking me leading up to Saturday, what would be worse, the, the projected forecast with the cold rain or the snow that we had in Coach Prime's first spring game? And to me, it's not even not even a debate. Cold rain is much worse than snow. Adam, no debate at all. No debate at all. If you give me the choice, I'm going to go with that snow that we had year one every year before I take the cold rain. Uh, snow, you can shovel it, you can kick it out of the way, you can dust it off before it melts. It was a constant, even when it was a drizzle, it was still a constant rain, and it was cold water and cold wind. Give me the snow any day. Next year, it's going to be 65 and sunny, so uh, we have that to look forward to. It will be, and it's going to be 65 and sunny the day before the game and the day after the game. What were your main takeaways from Saturday's spring game? Uh, I love the attitude of how the weather didn't impact the players or the coaches. Uh, you know, I, I think there was certainly understandably an impact weather-wise on uh, on the crowd showing up. But even the crowd that was there, uh, bigger than I thought that would be in attendance, and they were engaged and they were making noise, and it really felt like, you know, a real game from a crowd standpoint that was there. Uh, and the players as well. You know, you thought that people were just going to kind of take it light and easy, just go out there for a few minutes, do a few things because of the weather and conditions. But everybody was into it, man. So I love the enthusiasm. It was cool to see Isaiah Hard step up and make some big plays at running back. Jeremiah Brown had a, a nice day defensively. Uh, looks like a guy that, that can help them on defense this year. Uh, was, was there a position group, as you kind of reflect on CU's 15 spring practices, that – you felt made pretty decent strides from the start of spring ball to what you saw in that spring game. I got to go with the uh, with the offensive line, but I got to share this with you, Adam, and to the, to the audience out there. This offensive line over 14 practices had come together, jailed, developed a relationship amongst themselves and with Shadour that it made it seem like they've been playing together for a couple of years. Then we get out there for the scrimmage for practice 15, and I think it was the second play, and we gave up a snap, a sack, and I was like, oh, man, here we go again. Like, come on, come on, guys. Uh, but they turned it around. So I think uh, unit by unit, position by position, we needed to upgrade the offensive line the most as well as the defensive line. Both of those things were done. I'm going to give the offensive line uh, the, the nod and the check mark as far as that most improved group, though. And that's a group that's going to be adding pieces. We've seen uh, transfer portal news here in, in, in recent days that uh, that group is going to have uh, uh, quite the competition as we get into the summer months. Uh, I'm curious, based on spring ball, Neely, if you are going to put together a four by one relay team, who are you picking for that? That's a great question because we got some speed out there. Uh, you know, you lost – uh, a speed demon in Dylan Edwards uh, when he transferred, but I'm going to go with four relay. Let's go Jimmy Horn Jr. Uh, how about Wester, McKinney, DJ McKinney, who just got in number eight, and then Travis okay. Hunt. Then Travis okay. Hunt. I, those guys, their speed is remarkable. I think their level that they love to compete is remarkable, and they have that uh, – you know, we're going into the Olympics to the summer games. They got that that swagger about them, you know, that uh, you're not faster than me swagger. So give me those fours. Give me give me Horn, Wester, McKinney, and Hunter. And watching Travis Hunter play Nickelback was a, a treat on Saturday. Uh, you got a chance to do that more uh, throughout the spring. Uh, he just does everything at a high level. Uh you could probably put him at nose tackle and he'd find some way to excel on that position at, uh, what is he about 175 pounds? Yeah. With a brick in his pocket. Uh, I, I, I think that defensive line is just about the only thing he can do because you can, you can blitz with him off the edge if you wanted to, you know, he has the speed to get there and he can certainly tackle a quarterback or take on a block 
uh, from a running back. But Travis can move just about anywhere on the defense. You know, you shouted out Jeremiah Brown as we start the show. I think some of the additions that we have that will be coming in at linebacker are going to allow JB to move from more linebacker to edge rusher. So probably going to be spending more time with Vincent Dancy than he does okay. with Coach. But the talent that's out there on the field, I say that to say, you know, the Travis Hunter's talent, uh, the JB talent, uh, whether it's Trevor Woods and the way you can move him around and the things that Cam Silver and Craig can do and Shiloh can do, you really can give the uh, the offense opponent, you can give them different looks that they haven't seen the week before in your film because you can move guys around to play multiple positions. Well, the main priority here is answering your questions. So let's see what the fans want to ask today, Neely. Our first question comes from Nick Braxt, 31. He asked, what areas have you seen Shadur improve in the most? And do you see him doing more audibles at the line of scrimmage this year? A second part first. I don't know about more audibles or even less. He has the keys to this offense. You know what? Now that I think about it, I'm going to go with more because of the relationship he has with, with Pat Shermer, you know, this go around. But either way, whether he was under uh, 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 last year's offense or Jack State's offense, it's Shadur Sanders' offense. You know, he gets to make adjustments at the line of scrimmage. You'll see him ask for a different receiver, send the, send the receiver out the game. You know, it's it's his to have control of. What I've seen him improve the most, uh, hard to pinpoint one thing, but I do like the, the body development. He's bigger. Uh, he's faster. He's stronger. Uh, he's done a lot of emphasis on his core strength uh, as well as his leg strength. Uh, you know, his arm has always been there as far as being to get the ball downfield. His, and his accuracy uh, is one of those things that's always, you know, tick, 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 ticking up and improving. You know, he was about 75 percent, you know, actually can approach 80. Uh, but I'm going to go with just his overall body, his strength, the way he looks. Uh, he, he, he looks taller. Uh, he looks bigger. He looks stronger. He's moving faster. He's more fluid. Uh, he's been putting, again, some emphasis on his core and legs. I think he'll be a better quarterback in 2024 than he was in 2023. Obviously, we're expecting much better protection for Shadur Sanders this year, but there are going to be times when the play breaks down. Based on last year and kind of the learning experience at times dealing with some of those different pressures, do you think that he's also gotten better just in the sense of when is it time to extend a play and when is it time just to bail out and throw that thing out of bounds? I think he has gotten better that, to, to throw out of bounds uh, you know, but he is a football player and he doesn't mind being tackled. And so sometimes when the play gets away, you know, he's going to take that ball up the middle if that linebacker's safety has moved and he's going to get you 20 yards. There's a particular game last year, uh, uh, Adam, I think he hit 20 miles per hour running, you know, and he and he's kind of deceptive with his speed. Doesn't look like he's moving all that fast, but when he gets in open space, you know, he really can put the leg work in and get down the field. Uh, I don't think he has you know, just the notion in his head that I'm the quarterback, I'm so valuable to this team, I don't need to be getting hit. He's a football player, uh, and he's a football player first. So as much as the coaches would love him to maybe throw that away and not run, he's going to do the football play first. Our next question comes from MF Bloom. Do you think the roster will ever stabilize enough to have a spring ball setup that looks like most other programs? I'm all in on the transfer-heavy roster strategy for CU. However, I do worry about the lack of development that takes place during spring ball. Seems like other programs get 15 practices in a simulated game against top competition, while a lot of guys' reps are against a lot of our guys' reps are against walk-ons. Good question there. I th I think that part of that problem has just been the timeline uh, with the portal the last couple of years, right? And and, and hopefully that's not an issue going forward. Yeah, I you know, I I got a little pushback on the question. I, I do understand, you know, where they're coming from with what they're asking. But when you compare it to other programs, uh, even with the portal impact that we've had uh, the past two years, this spring game and last year's spring game, I've seen power four spring games where they're just out there doing tug of war because they don't have enough, you know, bodies to go around. They're just out there doing mat drills and that kind of thing. Uh, I think that our spring ball – is always predicated upon competition, is always predicated upon player development. Uh, you know, the guys that get here for strength and conditioning, January, February, March, uh, when you get to spring ball in April, I think, you know, the players are developed and developed enough where they compete. This is not a matter of, you know, scholarship versus walk-ons because every program in the nation, in the Power Four, you're going to have walk-ons that contribute. 
Uh, so just because a guy doesn't have a scholarship doesn't mean that they don't offer competition. Uh, you look at Charlie Offerdahl, who just recently, this past weekend, got on scholarship, and he's running over starting linebacker. So uh, I do think, Adam, you spot on that the nature of the beast with the spring transfer portal opening up, that there will be people who you've been working with and developing throughout the spring uh, that may not be there for that spring game. Uh, but I think Coach Prime is always going to have you know enough players out there to compete, to develop, uh, where the spring game is truly the 15th practice that it's supposed to be. And even with all those guys that hit the portal and the fact that a lot of the reinforcements that are coming in for Colorado haven't gone on campus yet, I'm still telling you on Saturday there's a whole lot more talent out there than I'm used to covering Colorado football. So uh, sometimes I think it, Colorado fans, I don't want to say have gotten spoiled with uh, you know, having guys like Travis Hunter and Shadur Sanders in this program. But uh, you got to think back to what that spring game, and I know you weren't around, Neely, but like it was pretty tough to watch those spring games uh, back in, in 2021 and 2011. And so that part of that perspective needs to be, be put in there too from a Colorado standpoint. Well, I appreciate you putting that in, you know, with the rich history of Colorado football and nobody knows it better than you so. Great salient point to put there. Uh, but let me also add this. Here you had a depleted running back room. Uh, you know, you have three guys who were making an impact transfer out. You have two guys who were capable of a major impact and Charlie and Michael who were injured and did not play. So that's five running backs missing. But when you watch that game on Saturday, you didn't miss a thing from the running back room uh, because you're able to move a DB once a receiver to running back. And he put on a hell of a show. Uh, I think this team has athletes across the board that you can plug and play with. And regardless of the portal or ones versus twos or what have you, you're going to be entertained, even though it's just the 15th practice. Both Palm 42 and OBD Biza asked about the strategy to go ones v twos in practices. They asked if they ever go ones versus ones. Uh, this is pretty normal for college football programs. Uh, but to answer their question, what what do you think goes into that strategy from Coach Prime and this coaching staff's uh, standpoint? There's not a two in America that does not want to be a one. And the only way as a two that you can prove you should be a one is that you need to be able to beat the ones. And so Coach Prime loves to create a scenario where it's ones versus twos. Uh, and that's something that's just designed to bring out the best in people. Uh, you look at an Amaria Miller when he's running with the twos on offense, he's having to get away from Travis Hunter on defense. That's only iron sharpening iron and getting him ready uh, because he will never face a stronger defender in a game that he's facing in practice. Uh, but let me just tell you the questioner that there are times throughout practice and even the spring game where you see Coach Prime say, uh-uh, time for ones versus ones. Let's, let's let them go at it. And you really see that uh, in the individual stuff, uh, when the 707s are taking place and you got the offensive line versus D-line down in the end zone, they, they certainly go ones versus ones all the time. And again, going back to kind of this being norm for college football programs, when you get in season, every college football program has got a scout team that the ones are going against. So it, it's, it is, again, across the landscape, pretty rare for ones versus ones as kind of a, a regular thing in practice. Yeah, absolutely. So, Blitzmore444 asked, I have not noticed any observations on Jalen Wester, the transfer linebacker. Do either of you have any insights? I, I think the arrow is pointing up. You know, I think that this room is also going to get some competition coming into it through the portal. The linebacker room was one of those areas that needed improvement, uh, but you kind of forgot how much it needed improvement because you were so focused on the needs at the defensive line for stopping the run. But we were in a situation last year where your linebackers and even safeties were leading the team in tackles. So you know you needed some help in the defensive line stopping the run. But I think that linebacker room uh, through Western and others is, is going to be much improved. And Coach Hart is excited about it. He'll tell you he sleeps well at night because he knows what he's got and what he's got coming in with the portal. And his brother, Lejonte Wester, of course, put on a show on Saturday. What would you think of his his dance after his, his touchdown there? You know, I was uh, I was happy to see it. I love to see these young people have a good time after having put in the work and success becomes a reality. They should celebrate it. Uh, the dance itself, probably going to see it a lot this year. Needs a little work and a little tweaking. Uh, but for it to be raining and the conditions, I still give it an A+. 
Florida Buff asked, how does the CU NIL war chest compare with other power four teams? We have seen the 54th 30 Foundation and Buffs for Life NIL Collective join forces into the 5430 Alliance and they've been doing some hiring. And so things are things are looking up in there. Are you what are where are you at in terms of being able, able to talk about NILs? Is that something that's allowed in your shoes? Sure, sure. We 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 talk about it and discuss it. Uh, we help uh, the alliance, you know, promote what they're doing. And I think, Adam, you just really answered the question. Uh, we were so behind the curve uh, that it made sense for us, you know, to pull the two entities together. And I think you're going to see more of that. Uh, you're going to see more people joining forces to get this done, because as it relates to the power four and some of the big boys out there in football, uh, we don't have the cash that they have. Uh, we don't have the cash that they have, but it's something that we're working on from an organizational standpoint uh, to make sure that we can be competitive in that space and also then begin to rise above. So uh, the alliance is something that everybody should participate in. Uh, it's one of those real world applications where you can impact winning. You know, I'm not going out there and making a tackle. I'm not going out there and making a block. Uh, but I can throw in thirty dollars a month and help us get the right talent in here in the right places uh, through these nonprofits, promotions, and NIL and the collective to make sure that we're not losing the best of the best. You know, just because we're not organized, organized, excuse me, from a collective NIL space. So uh, I think the staff people that are coming on to the alliance, you know, know what they're doing. They have a good grasp of what our needs are. They're in constant communication with the AD and the coaches. So I'm looking for the arrow pointing up. But as it stands right now. All these activities are taking place be, because we are behind. It is great to see that arrow pointing up with the collective because that is so important in recruiting nowadays. It is frustrating at the same time, Neely, that if NIL was enforced to the strict letter of the law of what name, image, and likeness was created for, Colorado would probably have the best NIL out there, right, because of Coach Prime, but because of the collectives and the boosters and their involvement, which again, hopefully Colorado fans get involved with that because that this is the reality that we live in. But just from a real true name, image and likeness standpoint, Colorado has got to be pretty high up there in terms of what they can offer these guys. And, and I think that's spot on. I think we have the gravitas of coach prime uh, who spent 14 years in the league, 14 years in broadcasting and marketing uh, and has just connections all over the place as it relates to, you know, his own name, image, and likeness. This is no doubt the place to be. We just have to get that collective side uh, up to par. But there's no better place, man, for you to play football in this current college football landscape uh, because let's, let's not only forget this, let's not forget this, Adam. These collectives are going after, you know, the five stars. They're going after, you know, guys that they're recruiting just purely based on the talent that they have. And here's the here's the bag right now. Come play for us. But when it comes to development and getting a player past NIL to the NFL, when you look at the NFL experience on this staff, the player development on this staff and add in the NIL potential, there's no better program in America to be than going forward than right here. And I think you're going to see in this recruiting class and classes to come uh, that regardless of where we are in the collective spectrum, that that's really going to aid us in getting the best in here. All right, spring ball has been wrapped up and finals are going to be starting up for the players pretty soon. They get a break and then, you know, we you got to fill in the, the roster gaps here and there. But by and large, they, they've done a good job of filling most of those gaps here in recent days through the portal. What what do the coming weeks look like for you in the pregame show? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to take a little time off, still putting out content from the spring uh, that was not released during the spring. So. Uh, whereas you may see some things from early April, it's going to be your first time seeing it. Uh, some exclusive interviews and sit downs that we put in the bank to get us through that quote unquote off season. Uh, a lot of the coaches will be hitting the road, uh, you know, for recruitment in May. Uh, we'll be coming back around Memorial Day weekend, Memorial Day week to get back into the strength and conditioning phase. Uh, so college football, man, Adam, as you know, is year round. You get a couple of weeks in January and a couple of weeks in May, you know, that you're truly off if there is such a thing. But then it's it's back at it full time after that. I will say this to everybody about the about the portal. You know, the portal closes on April 30th. 
that's just the deadline to get in it. Uh, you have all the time in the world to get out of it. So the recruitment part of this, you know, never stops. There'll still be official visits, you know, taking place in May. Uh, so look for more announcements of who's going to be joining this team as we get ready for fall ball. And even guys that graduate in May can then enter because, you know, this these windows are only for the non-graduates. Graduates can basically enter at any time. So there will be kind of this continued trickle of players in the portal uh, as we get closer to the summer months. But Neely, that's another episode of In the Bag with Uncle Adam. Always enjoy you for taking time out. It's been great to get your thoughts and also great just to kind of hear what fans are thinking about out there. Yeah, we love it, the fan the fan impact and what they've been asking. So, you know, uh, this partnership with you, Adam, has been blazing. Can't wait to keep it going across the summer and into the fall. So whether it's Adam's social media, my social media, where you see us at the grocery store, give us the questions and we're going to get in the bag and answer <laughs> Awesome. Well, you're going to take some time off. I'm going to do the same with an eye on that transfer portal, but I appreciate everybody out there for tuning in.